If your home were a restaurant, how many cooks would you have to be just to get dinner done? Well, you're going to have the answer today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. We are live together every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If this surprises you, <laughs> then you didn't go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and register for my live alert system whenever I jump into the kitchen, think of something I want to share with you, or especially when I can send you a note at quarter to 12 Eastern time on Tuesdays, because that's when we go live. We're the carefree cooks, right? We create our own recipes. This brings friends and family together. We learn every time we cook. We define our own cooking style. We practice pro cooking methods and we love our cooking. Cooking isn't a chore. Cooking is fun and exciting and we love it and we love being together. And I see the scroll going crazy here. All our friends are with us. Susan Ringler, hi from Pennsylvania, Susan. Hi, Carol Harris from Wales. I'm dying to visit Wales, Carol. Uh, Anna is with us from Toronto and Bernie and Charlie and Michael and Dave and Kimberly and Kevin Murray and oh, too many people to mention. I'm glad that we're all together. I've got, uh, speaking of which, I've got a what am I for you today to start this Carefree Cooks Code in the comments section below. Please tell me what am I? Hmm. Hmm. What are these three things? Maybe I can zoom that for you. Let's see. There you go. Those three things is the what am I. So I'll give you another minute to think about it. There's a shell looking thing. Oh, wait, there's something in only half the shell right there. And then that looks uh, that. OK, so what am I? <laughs> Tell me in the comments what those three ingredients uh, make. And that's what our what, what am I is for today. I'm so glad we're together again every Tuesday at noon. It's another Tuesday where we get to uh, move our journeys forward. We get to progress what we're doing. We get to take more steps. We get to add more tools to our tool belt. That's the way I think of it. If you're awake, <laughs> if you're aware, if you're listening, if you're accepting new information and new ideas, you know, even if they might contradict what you already think to know or what you already think you know. <laughs> Let me try and say that a little better. Okay, we're here together today because we are open to new ideas, right? But just because a new idea might seem to contradict something that you think you already know doesn't make it instantly wrong, right? It's This is, a, I hope, a learning community. This is what my life's passion is. This is why we have tens of thousands of people all over the, the, the world in this movement because they want to move forward. They, they want to learn new things and being curious, having an open mind, um, being joyful at a new discovery instead of being combative and protecting what you already believe. That's a necessary part of the journey of learning anything, a necessary part in your journey to becoming a carefree cook. Look, if you're not willing to learn something new, don't waste your time arguing with other people who might have something valuable to share. It's just a waste of time. But look, if you can take new information, if you can find a place for it, right? Some Something that helps fuel or move your journey forward Oh, goodness, you're in the right place. You're in the right place every Tuesday at noon because I'm still doing it. I'm learning every day. 
And like I said just last week, I'm learning from you. <laughs> and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I, I learn from you sharing your cooking ideas and inspirations. All right, I'll admit, I steal them. <laughs> I steal a bunch of them. But, hey, that's why we're all here, right? We're all here to steal from each other. Uh, ideas, that is. Steal ideas from each other. Because when you, when you stuff all that knowledge into the front pocket of your kitchen apron, <laughs> you start to realize that your cooking can be better than any restaurant that you've been going to. Your cooking can be better, cheaper, easier, uh, safer, food safer, healthier. And, you know, you get that sense of pride in having done it yourself. And other than my students <clears throat> that I learn from, like I said, and people that I admire in the culinary world, one of the places I learn new things is at a restaurant. And <clears throat> you know I love to cook, but uh, you, you got to <laughs> you got to admit, uh, or you can't think that I cook 365 days a year. You know, I mean, I love doing it, but not every single day. Heather and I do go to restaurants, and I have to support other chefs as well. But look, the difference is I don't go to restaurants that don't cook as well as I do. And, and the number of them continues to shrink. So when Heather and I do go out, it's often to one of the really nice restaurants. You know, it's a, it's a special occasion, splurge kind of thing. I, I try to go to someplace on the cutting edge of culinary trends so I can bring these new ideas back into my own kitchen. And then I can come here and I can share them all with you. We can all steal from each other. Like I said, well, a few days ago, Heather and I went to the recently opened Alexander Brown restaurant here in beautiful downtown Baltimore, Maryland, Charm City. And Alexander Brown and Sons, very important in the country, not only in Baltimore history, but this was the very first investment bank in the United States. Opened in 1808, this first, the very first investment hedge fund, uh, not hedge fund, uh, uh, venture capitalists, you know, uh, you could say Alexander Brown sh started the shark tank. <laughs> okay. So if you know what the shark tank on TV is, that's what Alexander Brown and sons did in 1808. And the very first thing they did was raise money for Baltimore's water system, which I think is still <laughs> in there today. Um, but Alexander Brown and sons was the prime investor in the Baltimore and Ohio railroad in 1927. But look, I could go on for an hour about the Irish immigrant and the prominent prominent Baltimorean whose family changed our country for generations. He, along with his sons, William, George, John, and James. Uh, but look, <laughs> this is supposed to be about food and cooking. I'm not here to talk about Baltimore history. Anyway, the original bank was built in 1901, and it survived the great Baltimore fire of 1904, wiped out the city, and it's still standing today. It's still owned by the Brown family, but it's been fully renovated, and it's opened now as a really cool kind of hot cuisine restaurant. It is exquisite <laughs> inside the gold leafing and white marble and the, the portraits uh, of the, like the original land granted Lord Baltimore portrait on the wall, along with a whole bunch of really impressive artwork and old maps of the inner harbor, uh, along with paintings of horses, hounds, and, and clipper ships. And that's <laughs> That's the trifecta in Baltimore, horses, hounds, and clipper ships on the wall. That means you're in a nice building in Baltimore, huh? Anyway, you're sitting there eating, and you're feeling like you're eating in 1901. You know, I mean, it is just a, 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 the ambiance, the nostalgia that comes over you. And I know, <laughs> all right, I'm off on a tangent because I want to talk about chefs and, and how many chefs you'd have to be, but I need to set this up for a minute, okay? So I need to tell you about this experience because this was what brought all this to mind. And I, I know you're going to stop me and the comments are going to say, what did you eat? What did you order? So let me take a minute to do that because I know you're going to ask me about it. I didn't take any photos. And I, you know, I kind of think it's bad form you know, to take especially flash photos in a fancy restaurant. So I didn't take any photos at the time, but I do, I did take some off their website. So they serve these crab beignets as an appetizer. And when I saw it on the menu, I thought it was kind of an average thing, you know, really pedestrian 
uh, type appetizer for a place like this to serve. And, you know, you expect to get the overly breaded, really dirty oil, you know, dark uh, an oily crab fritter that so many places uh, serve in Baltimore. But, you know, I was uh, amazed and I wound up telling the server uh, that it was like a crab cloud. I mean, it was so light. It was so clean. It was freshly crabby, uh, served with an avocado creme fraiche, lots of Old Bay, of course. Uh, be before it even came to our uh, table, I could smell the Old Bay as the waiter was bringing it. But anyway, it was awesome. I, I ordered a duck breast. This was served with the most amazing savory black rice, pickled daikon, and uh, grilled baby bok choy is what it was. Heather had a king salmon that had a really nice crispy skin. Uh, they served this with beluga lentils, summer squash, a romesco sauce, and a tempura squash blossom. <laughs> it was the tempura squash blossom. Really, really put it over the top. And so it was like eating one of the works of art off the wall, you know? And yes, like I said, my cooking is better than most of the restaurants around, but how many cooks would it take to pull this meal together? Cooking fish, cooking a duck breast, uh, making a clean and crispy tempura, steaming vegetables, making black rice. I mean, is it possible? Could one person have all these skills? Nah, <laughs> they can't. There's more than one guy. There's more than one chef making those plates in the back of the kitchen. There's a whole team of them, as a matter of fact, and it's called the Kitchen Brigade. And as I sat there <laughs> in food heaven, I started thinking about all the people that go into making my plate. I'm looking down at this plate and I'm starting to count the people on my head. Like it just comes to you, it just gets dropped on your table. I'm looking at it like, oh my goodness, how many people were involved in that? And I start thinking about how many chefs I have to be when I make dinner. And I'm always thinking about you, <laughs> my carefree cooks. So I start thinking about how many chefs you would have to be to make a meal like that. And that's when I started checking off all the skills in my head. Could I do that? Right, do, do, do I have the confidence to do that, the duck breast? Am I confident enough to make black rice? I start going, how many roles in the kitchen brigade system could I fill? And today, that's the question that I wanna ask you. How many roles could you fill in a classical kitchen brigade system. How many cooks, better said, how many cooks do you have to be to make the meals that you really love or the meals that you put on your table? And all of this, to explain it, has to go back a little bit in culinary history. And there's a guy named Auguste Escoffier. Escoffier is considered the father of modern cuisine. He is the guy that created the brigade system that we're going to talk about today. And perhaps I'll do a culinary history episode one day in the future. You know, what do you think? Hey, is that a good idea or not? Should I? Would you like to know about uh, things like, say, who invented the first restaurant? Would you like to know uh, when it went from Prick's Fix menus to, to order off a, a la carte menu? Give me a thumbs up or something in the comments. Give me a yes if you'd like to know more about culinary history and great chefs. All right, I'll, <laughs> I'm getting off tangent again. Cool. I'll do that in the future sometime. We'll do a, a culinary history uh, uh, episode. Anyway, before restaurants... Most large kitchens were in the household of a noble, a very rich or important person, and it was chaos. Because the kitchen duties then were organized by the type of food, not the skill or task to be completed. And Escoffier, he came in and he changed all this. It was about 1885 at the Savoy Hotel in London. Escoffier is quoted often as saying, the chaos has to stop or stop the chaos. And he created the very same brigade system that most restaurants use today. The best place to see the brigade system in action is on a cruise ship. If you've ever taken a cruise, 
you've seen, or maybe you haven't been back in the kitchen. You know, if you ever do take a cruise, ask for a tour of the kitchen. It's amazing. But that's where the classical brigade system is most in use today. And also in the dining room, by the way, there's a classical service brigade as well. And Maybe that'll be another episode we touch on in the future. So, but let me get to it. Here it is. Here is Escoffier's classical brigade system. Let me ask you, how many of these jobs do you do or could you do? And as a disclaimer, please forgive my French pronunciations. If you speak French beautifully, understand that I don't. I speak kitchen French. That's about it. So here we go. At the top of the kitchen is the chef de cuisine or the chief of the kitchen, most often called the executive chef today. And, you know, it's really not a cooking position, the executive chef. It's a management position. This is the position that creates the menus, uh, purchases, does the purchase list, purchases the raw food, hires the staff, uh, brings in apprentices, does training, manages the kitchen, manages the costs, things like that. That's been me in many of my jobs. Executive chef at a large hospital. I've run my own catering company. It's a lot more time behind a desk than it is behind a stove. But that's you, right? Aren't you the chef de cuisine in your own kitchen? You order the food? You make up the menu? Yeah, that's you. You're the executive chef. Good for you. Well, below him or her is the sous chef de cuisine, or the under chief of the kitchen. It's not S-O-U-X. I, <laughs> I saw many years ago an, a, wanted, a, a, a help wanted ad in a newspaper, and it said sous chef. S-I-O-U-X. Sous chef. Like the Indian tribe. The Native American. Anyway, it was funny. Uh, so the sous chef is the person that carries out the orders of the chef de cuisine. They accept the incoming food from the vendors. They, they often take inventory. They track food usage so the chef de cuisine can figure out the food cost. And most often, they run the kitchen because the chef de cuisine really isn't there during service time. They're home watching TV usually. Uh, so let me ask you, do you put away the groceries? Uh, maybe your spouse comes in with the groceries, you put them away, boom, there you are. You're the chef de cuisine too. Uh, next is the saucier. The saucier is the sauce maker. And in smaller kitchens, saucier usually makes all the soups also. Very similar, as you can see. Well, this is the third person in charge of the kitchen. Right under the sous chef, the saucier is one of the most important people, one of the most respected positions in the kitchen because of the, the I mean, the really obvious skill <laughs> that it takes to make a whole variety of source, sauces for fish, for meat, for game, for everything. But again, look down at your own palm, if you want, or look in the mirror. You're the saucier, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're, you're making sauces in your own kitchen. So we're up to three jobs that you now do in your own kitchen. The cuisinier is a really a line cook. And, and it it's, doesn't translate to a modern kitchen as well today. But this is the person that, that like assembles the dishes using the heat with the pre-prepared ingredients set up for them. So if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know there's a steam table or there's prep, you know, for the ingredients. They are the people that take the prep and, and combine it on the saute, in the deep fryer or whatever it might be. So you are the cuisinier of your kitchen also. Four jobs, there you go. Then there's the commis. The commis is a junior cook. The commis is uh, a lot of times a, a, an apprentice or someone in training. They assist the cuisinier. And if you've got children in your household uh, or if your spouse is helping you cook, you can call them the commis from now on. They are the junior cook. Um, and then this is classified by the stations set up by the cooking method and not by the cooking food. So this is how the brigade system changed everything in a, a, a commercial culinary. I hesitate to say commercial because, again, it was lords and ladies and rich people. It wasn't really a restaurant, but that's where Escoffier came in, and that's where Escoffier agrees with me. <laughs> Even though he died 150 years before I was born, he agrees with me. It's more about methods. Well, maybe I got it from a Scoffier. Yeah, it's probably the other way around. Methods are more important than what you were cooking, and that's how he changed the kitchen around. So the rotisseur is the roast cook. This is the person, usually in front of the oven or the spit or the rotisserie, this is the person using indirect convective heat to roast large pieces of meat or whole birds. 
Then there's the griardon. This is the grill cook, person working on a grill, applying direct, intense, conductive heat for grilled items. The friturier, I don't think I got that one, is the fry cook. This is the person that cooks stuff in hot oil. The poissonier is the fish cook, prepares all the seafood dishes, as well as a lot of times does the cleaning and portioning of whole fish. So you won't really find like the griardin breaking down whole pieces of meat. That we're going to get to in a minute. The poissonier, though, may very well be the person that guts and fillets the fish, unless the butcher does it, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then there's the autrimetier. This is the entree cook. This is the preparer, um, they call it. Uh, sometimes they prepare soups or sauces or garnishes. Sometimes they do vegetables. Uh, sometimes they do egg dishes. It depends on the size of the kitchen. But if there is an undercook to the entremetier, uh, entre if there is an undercook, then he really becomes like a mini executive chef under the people that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And in a modern brigade, this has become the expediter. This, or they call it announcer sometimes. This is the person that stands at the very end of the line when the plate has been fully assembled. They put the garnish on. They wipe the rim of the plate. They make sure everything is perfect. They are the last person to touch the plate, last back of the house staff to touch the plate before it goes to a waiter or waitress. Otherwise, the entremetier oversees these positions, okay? So depending on the size of the kitchen. There is a potager which makes all the soups. They report to the entremetier. The legumier is the vegetable cook. They do a lot of steaming, poaching vegetables for prep or later service. And it seems to me that you're probably all of those jobs <laughs> in your kitchen also, right? So what's that? What are you up to? You're up to about 10 jobs now? All right, let's keep going. There's the gourmanger. The gourmanger is the pantry supervisor or literally means food keeper. They're responsible for cold preparations of hors d'oeuvres. They're responsible for pâtés, uh, terrines, aspics, things like that. Um, a lot of times uh, they will make the leafy salads as well. Um, they'll make the cold protein salads. Uh, for uh, They'll do uh, buffet designs for weddings, things like that. So if you've ever made a uh, tuna salad, <laughs> if you've ever made chicken salad for lunch, boom, there you are. You're the gourmet manger also in your own kitchen. Let me ask you this. Are you using your knife skills to break down whole chickens into parts, saving you a bunch of money, ultimately getting you free chicken? <laughs> like I advise in web cooking classes, then you're the boucher too. You're the butcher. If you bake, you're probably doing another five jobs in your kitchen. The potassier is the pastry cook, prepares the sweets and other baked goods. And sometimes uh, the patissier also makes fresh pasta because the procedure is so similar, the mixing, you know, and so on of dough. The confiture makes candies and pedophores. Um, at the Alex Brown restaurant that I started uh, this the whole thing talking about, at the very end of the meal with the check, <laughs> so you don't choke on it, um, you get these gorgeous little chocolates uh, filled with like a hazelnut cream, I think it was, and these jellied raspberry squares. Um, they come with the final check just as that last taste. Well, it's the confiture, if they had one, that's making that stuff. Otherwise, it's the pastry cook. Uh, and there you have it. Those three, the butcher, the baker, and the candy maker. <laughs> Isn't that how it goes? No? That's like uh, one of my mentors way back when, Chef Jan Bandula, Chef Bandula was a Polish, um, uh, God, he had the highest title you can have in pastry chefs. And I took classes with him. He was so funny. If you brought something to Chef Bandula that wasn't very good, he would look at you with this heavy Polish accent and he would say, you must be candlestick maker. You are not butcher. You are not baker. You must be candlestick maker. <laughs> it cracked. That's when he didn't like what you made. Uh, the glossier. The glossier makes frozen cold desserts. Uh, very often uh, is the ice cream maker, is really the ice cream chef. Uh, do you ever make ice cream in your home? You're the glossier too then. Oh, like at one of my favorite restaurants in the world. Oh my goodness. The Gilda restaurant in Barcelona. And my, chef, my friend Michel Bierve, uh, he hired an ice cream chef on staff. And he's the guy that pairs fried shrimp, or they call them crispy prawns, these gigantic 
prawns with a basil ice cream. I know it's crazy. It's nuts. Uh, those of you that have my Spanish food finds DVD or online course, uh, you can see the interview with him and the incredible he dishes he makes with ice cream along with his glossier. Uh, the decorator, or I guess decorator, uh, <laughs> creates show pieces. Uh, make specialty cakes, things like that. Uh, you'll see somebody serving that role at a wedding or a catering company. Uh, very often they'll make filigree. Filigree are like little chocolate decorations that get stood up on your cupcakes, things like that. Um, uh, they will garnish cakes and desserts as well. Uh, the boulanger is the baker. Um, often splitting responsibilities with a pâtissier who does sweet baked goods. Boulanger uh, generally does breads and rolls. So how many of those positions are you doing in your kitchen? Oh, there's two more very important ones. The plongeur is the dishwasher. I bet that's you too. Uh, and in a larger kitchen, there's a marmiton, and that's the heavy pot washer. And I bet that's your job in the kitchen too. That's it. It's all those jobs. And I'll tell you what, not only at home, but if you own your own catering company like I did, you are definitely every one of those jobs. I can remember Chef Greg and I, rest in peace, Chef Greg, uh, we would come home from a wedding at two in the morning, you know, after doing a wedding, and have 75 sheet pans to wash and all the chafing dishes and all those things. So, and I didn't even keep score back then. So what's your score? Were you keeping score? That's 21 classical brigade jobs that you're probably doing in your own kitchen. Congratulations. Good for you. You're doing the work of 21 people just to get food on the table every night. But you still love it, don't you? You do. I know you love it. And now you can be even more proud of what you're creating because you're also developing a specialized skill set. You don't just cook. You create. You invent. You improvise. You do what 21 other people would be doing if they were there but they're not. <laughs> they're just you. It's just you. And you know, I cringe every time somebody tells me that, oh, Chef Todd, I just can't cook. You know, there are people that think that you're just born knowing how to cook or not. And I'm here to tell you, it's not a gene. It's a combination of skills. It's just like we talked about earlier. If you're open to learning, you can own them all. And that's why having a sense of forward motion, of progressing in your journey toward becoming a carefree cook is so important. Because each new skill you add to your repertoire, the greater variety of meals you can make. And the less chefs from the 1800s you have to be. <laughs> then we can all be all the positions in our own home restaurant. You never have labor strikes. <laughs> you never have disputes. You don't have anybody asking for a raise. All the votes are always unanimous. Oh, by the way, to get on another soapbox, you notice there's no uh, instapateur, the, the instapot cook. There's no sous vide sous chef. But I'm not going to get started on the gadgets today. Escoffier wouldn't like it. Escoffier would not like the gadgets. I, I just know they wouldn't. So my message today, be proud. You, you are constantly gathering new skills, new methods. You are knocking down one job at a time in a classical brigade system, and you're being all of them in your own kitchen. You should be proud. Congratulations. Who is serving the classical brigade system in our Carefree Cooks community? I go scrolling through there from time to time and then I screech, come to a halt because I go, oh my goodness, that's awesome. That is what Carefree Cooking is all about and that's where we get the dish of the week. And the dish of the week this week starts with Vania. She is the potager in her own home because she whipped up a carefree soup using all the stuff that she had around in her pantry, just totally improvising, throwing in even a can of Vienna sausages. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, a local uh, farm near Chrissy's house had some spaghetti squash, so Chrissy turned on her legumier skills and made a fantastic roasted squash 
with a cheese sauce. Doesn't that look awesome, all broiled and crispy like that? Uh, Annette did a beef and broccoli stir fry, good looking plate. Annette, uh, she was acting as the own cuisinier in her own house because all of those items usually need to be poached ahead of time, broccoli steamed, carrots pre-cooked, things like that. That's the cuisinier that puts uh, the line cooking and then puts it all together. Uh, Paul is the uh, patissier, patissier. I told you about my French pronunciations. Paul is the patissier in his own home. Uh, he is working on perfecting his cinnamon buns formula, uh, writing that it was a little dense. He wanted it this way, that way. We got to talking about how you can adjust the activity of yeast. So he's on a journey as well. And Connie, Connie's the poissonnier in her home. Look at this beautiful, bright, clean dish with healthy um, Argentinian prawns. That's what she said, stir fry, beautiful colors on that. People are using the classical positions in the brigade system in their own home every single day. And the only way that they're able to continue to do that is by learning more skills by gathering more skills again and again and again. Uh, the what am I for this week? We have an egg yolk, some clarified butter, and some lemon. An egg yolk, clarified butter, and lemon is hollandaise sauce. Those of you that guessed hollandaise for the what am I this week, you are correct. Uh, you know, and if you really enjoyed learning about the classical brigade system today, if you have a greater sense of pride because you're doing up to 21 jobs in your own kitchen, if you realize there is still so much to learn, please like and share this video so more people can become as free as we are in the kitchen. And if you'd like to put even more pro-level skills into your home kitchen, if you'd like to give yourself a long list of fancy French brigade titles, uh, then you need to see what's being taught in culinary school. And my class this week is the five skills taught in culinary school that are essential in all cooking. And you can hold a spot in the class time that's right for you by going to webcookingclasses.com slash skills. And even if your schedule is tight this week, you can go ahead and register for any class. You'll get the replay video sent to you to watch at your convenience. That's webcookingclasses.com slash skills and hold your spot in the next class. So Chef Todd Ma Moore, <laughs> remind I can't even pronounce my own name after all the French names. Uh, me, the chef guy, reminding you that there's a method to all the jobs that make up your cooking success. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.